So, um, like Pierre said, uh, this, you, you guys are at the Center for Computer Research and Music and Acoustics, and uh, my name is Sasha Lightman. John Granzo gave um, a laser with me, talk with me uh, a few months ago, and I just forgot to take him off the slide. But I'm going to show some of his work, so it's good that his name is still up here. Um, this is an interdisciplinary center. We've got a pretty even mix of artists and engineers. And uh, all of our engineers are also musicians and artists as well. And we expect all of our artists to do most of their own engineering. So it creates a really interesting environment. And uh, part of the challenge of this talk last time for me was that there were so many things I could talk about. Um, we, tonight we're going to have an outdoor concert. Uh, we, I don't know how many speakers are out there right now, but the last time we did it outside, it was a 24-channel surround sound system outside. And I think they're playing around with fewer speakers, but trying to elicit the same result. Uh, so if you, if you don't have anything going on, it's a wonderful way to listen to music underneath the stars, and I highly recommend it. Um, I'm not going to talk about that spatialization work that we do. And there's a lot of other work on psychoacoustics, on sonifying sounds such as like the sounds of a the sounds the sounds that can be created when uh, people are going through seizures. One of our researchers just did something um, on that. There's a lot of things I'm not going to talk about, but what I am going to focus on is the physical aspect of how we are interacting with our computers, because computers have become you know so insanely powerful. Um, there's so much that this little box can do. There's so much that my little phone can do that couldn't have been done a short while before. And some of the interesting questions that we get to ask here are, how does the human being interact with all of this technology? And so I'm just going to really focus on some physical ways that, we've discussed, that we were playing around with interaction. Um, yeah, so it's, it's CCRMA is an acronym, and it's pronounced karma. I get to say I work for karma. <laughs> um, so basically, this is a little like drawing that Michael Gervich um, made, uh, which I think is sort of a, a, good, a good place to begin. Um, when new technology is developed, it inspires new musical styles, new musical interactions, which then need new technology. And it's a circle that's not new to computers. It's, you know, it's been going on, you know, at an increasing rate over the last hundred years, but there, you know, Wagner's operas wouldn't have been possible in the ways that they are possible without the change in metal technology, which allowed the big, loud saxophone to be more prominent in orchestras. There's this constant interplay between technology and art. Um, and so one good example of this is, um, that I'm going to talk about is uh, what Max Matthews did. So Max was kind of the godfather of computer music. He's not the first person to make a computer make sound, but he was the first one to really put, get a lot of momentum behind it. Um, and so in 1957, he, he was working at Bell Labs, and they were working on satellite technology and technology for, for phones. And he was able to make a computer uh, make a little melody. And, um, and then and on top of that, he ended up writing the first computer language designed for music. It was called music. Good evocative name. So that's Max in 1960. I think that's Max in 1961. And uh, that's Max um, in sometime around the mid, around about five years ago. And when Bell Labs closed down, the thing that he decided to do with his retirement was come to Karma and work a lot on this instrument right here, which he called the radio baton. And so basically, what it had was. Um, it's sort of a, a plate of capacitive sensors, and you can tell, and the, the capacitive sensors can sense where these two batons are in a sort of X Y grid, and um, and then they can also tell how high the baton is from the screen. So I'm just going to show you a quick little, oh, I got this backwards, a quick little. Exit no. Yeah, we're good at technology around here. <laughs> <coughs> oh, rats. Well, there was a, there's, a, there's a great video. Go look it up online. Of, um, oh, that really stinks. Um, so 
basically what he did a lot of times was he would control the tempo of MIDI tracks that he had recorded for traditional pieces of music, and he was able to add a lot of express expressivity to the um, the pieces being played. Oh. Okay, um, so I think it's indicative of the fact. I mean, I think that's an interesting fact that that's how he chose to use his his retirement, not necessarily designing new software, but playing around with ways that you can use the software that we have to create new sounds and new new modes of interaction. Um, more recently, we've got a group here called the Stanford Laptop Orchestra, or SLORG. And, um, yeah, and so there's, there's, there's various laptop orchestras. There's PLORC in Prince, at Princeton, that's where it started, and um, they've proliferated. And so the basic idea is that one of the elements of an orchestra is that you hear when the string section is playing, and you hear when the, the woodwinds are playing, and there's a sort of interplay between the various musicians, and you, there's an interplay between the conductor and the musicians, and the various sections, and one way that that's achieved is, um, <clears throat> is through the sound actually coming from the cello. You know that it's the cello playing because you can hear it, and you can see it. And so they got around this by designing these um, hemis hemispheric speakers, which is in the bottom right-hand corner, and actually what it is is a salad bowl with some car stereo speakers in them. <laughs> but they sound really good. Um, and uh, yeah, there's some Ikea, they, they bought them all up. Um, and so each, each musician has this sort of, you know, station where they've got the same equipment, they, they all wear black, just like in a typical orchestra, and they do stuff. So here's, um, here is the laptop orchestra playing at the recently opened Bing Concert Hall. What? Do you want to switch to your computer? So no, no, we've just tried all this before everyone. Oh, here we go. There you go. Conductors are doing various commands and things will change. or someone in the laptop orchestra community writes, uh, perform it multiple times, work on refining it, and, and it gives the musicians in the orchestra a chance to make slight modifications as they're going along. And it, to me, the main thing that it does is it, is it allows us to explore sort of computer music within a template that is familiar to people. A lot of times the laptop orchestra makes people smile in a way that other experiments we do here don't. Uh, when Bing was being built, uh, when they first got their occupancy, it was still being, you know, the construction workers that were working on it were still installing chairs and doing all sorts of things like that. And the laptop orchestra went and did a concert for everyone who was working at Bing Concert Hall on building it. And 
people who weren't really exposed to com computer music or experimental art just had a blast and completely understood what was going on. Let's see. <coughs> Another way that, um, that we're sort of exploring some of this stuff is, um, is something that uh, John Granzo and I think it's Tom Rossing still in the audience. I think he, he took off. But John Granzo is one of our PhD students and uh, we are, he's working on using a 3D printer to play around with acoustics and do rapid prototyping of strange designs. So I've got this instrument here and I'm gonna play it for a second and I'm gonna pass it around. It has toddler germs on it, but if you don't care about that, you're more than welcome to play it. So the idea was that it was a, um, it was a recorder head, a small little trumpet end, and it's tied in a knot. The fun thing about this, which you wouldn't have gotten from most instruments, is that I picked it up and didn't see this part, and I went, oh, is it like this? <laughs> so, um, yeah, most of them are just having fun with that thing. <laughs> but, uh, but there is some interesting research happening out of it. I'll pass this around. Um, and what that 3D printer allows us to do is come up with some goofy idea and after two hours of, of computer work and maybe another hour of printing, have something that we can test and say, oh yeah, you know what, it actually, you can twist a flute like a pretzel and it doesn't matter one darn bit. So he taught a, he taught a, a, a summer workshop and these are some of the instruments that were invented. Um, one is, is a sort of slide flute that also had butt, uh, holes in it and could be expandable as with longer, clear tubing. Dave Kerr, who's one of our awesome community members and loves his iPhones, he's the, he's the guy that's standing in line behind Steve Wozniak um, every time a new iPhone comes out. He decided to make a, a, a penny slide whistle that was also a case for his iPhone. So as he pulled that pencil in and out, it did the little like, woo, woo, slide. <laughs> and uh, it was, it's, it's just good fun. Um, here's some other uh, examples. Well, we'll just keep moving then. Um, so that's that's those are two those are two examples of how we're playing with how you interact with the world. Um, there's another example which is a class that I, I, I'm getting to teach this quarter, um, which is called. It's changed a few times. It's called physical interaction design for musical instruments and. Basically what we're doing is teaching people to use sensors and microcontrollers and make musical instruments out of them. So this is a real, I'm gonna show you the technology behind this in a second, but this is a, a, a simple fun instrument that's been featured quite a bit um, that is made out of Play-Doh. So when the Play-Doh touches, notes happen. this class. So I'm going to pass around a cool item that has been used in the class for the last five years, which is, um, which is that, which is, uh, well, for the last five years we've used embedded Linux to, um, to do the sound design. So I'm going to pass around this box, and it's basically the whole instrument that is involved in, the, in this Do Re Mi. We have a microcontroller that's picking up sensor data. Uh, the sensors were in the, in the Play-Doh. And then that sensor data is sent to a Raspberry Pi. And before that, we were using something called the Beagle Board. 
And the Raspberry Pi is an amazing device that is now, um, it's commercially available, you can get it on Amazon, you can get it from the Raspberry Pi Foundation, and it's basically an entire computer sitting on this chip. There's HDMI uh, video output, there's USB, Ethernet connections, audio connections, and if I pull this thing out here, this is the S one of those SD cards from your camera, and that's the entire operating system and the entire hard drive on this computer. So $35 and you've got this working electronics working computer. Um, so what we're doing with this is we're running a small version of Linux that we, we, we have our own distribution of Linux here. It's called Satellite Karma. And this is called, no, our main distribution is called Planet Karma. And this is Satellite Karma. Satellite Karma broke last week and we had to make another one that was a temporary fix and we called it Comet Karma. <laughs> so. Yeah? Oh, those are, um, well, Play-Doh has, has a really high salt con content in it, and so that makes it really conductive. So they actually just took wires and soldered them to pennies and stuck them in the Play-Doh. Um, and so the more Play-Doh you had, between, you know, the, the, the more Play-Doh that was between the sensors, the, the, um, the higher the resistance. Um, this is a... Maybe less playful instrument. This is um, it's called Quadrophilia. It's by Jiffer Har Harriman, and um, he based it off of a, a lap steel guitar. Hi there. My name is Jiffer Harriman. I'm going to talk today about an instrument called the Quadrophilia. That I made. It's an electronic instrument. Um, got some sensors mounted on this wood. Got it powered up. Got it plugged into a guitar amp. And uh, let's talk about how to play it. All right, so I'm going to talk about the light. The ability to play different, play different inversions by just moving your fingers around a little bit. And um, I think that's what I really like about it. And um, it, it kind of turns it into more like a pedal steel guitar which um, has the ability to bend strings up and down um, by pulling on them or, or loosening them with pedals and knee levers and things like that. Okay. A couple last things to just point out about the instrument. Um, you might have noticed the idea... Sorry, I'm having such video troubles here. Um, it's a pretty evocative instrument. He's played it with a lot of, um, a lot of other musicians, and um, uh, it's, it's one of my favorites. I'm going to send this put this PowerPoint up on Piero's site and you can watch the full videos. Um, I have very little time left, but perhaps I'll show you one piece that was made by, um, by a former karma student who went on to work at Sennheiser um, Audio Company. And this is sort of a finished version of some of the prototypes that I'm showing and talking about. I can turn reverb on and do a very light one. 
the song and turn it off. If you like a lot of delay, lots and lots of delay, I can turn that on and turn it off again. The microphone. So all sorts of theme park performance opportunities. It'll be online. You're more than welcome to watch it. And um, I think that that ends what I have to say. There's more slides and more videos in the slide. If anyone has any questions, let me know.